oh, here's a team that's three layers down inside the CI organization, and they have the, quote, IoT initiative. Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. This is an episode of the Ventures in Industrial IoT series brought to you by GE Ventures. In the series, we explore success factors and challenges in industrial IoT markets with CEOs, investors, and experts. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight. I'm joined today by Tim Cho. Tim is wearing quite a few hats. He's the executive chairman of Lacida. He's a board member of Teradata, Blackbud, and Cloudbook, uh, chairman of IoT at Alchemist Accelerator, a lecturer at Stanford University, and Tim recently published the book Precision, Principles, Practices, and Solutions for the Internet of Things. Tim, before we launch into the topic, you've got quite a varied and impressive background. What would you like to um, add in order to just kind of frame where you're coming from? Well, I, I, let me frame it by explaining why. I uh, About now, 12 years ago, I was uh, working for uh, Larry Ellison, running what was the beginning of Oracle's cloud business. Uh, and uh, as Oracle was shifting, morphing into acquiring a number of software companies, I kind of went, well, you know, I didn't really want to be work on a lot of operational stuff, which is generally what happens in acquisitional phase. So I thought, well, I have long enough to figure out what I'm going to do the rest of my life, which I was thinking I wasn't going to go sit on a beach or go fishing. So uh, I took the opportunity to become a polygamist is how I describe this. And for quite some time, I had two questions in my mind. One was what was next for enterprise software? Because we had built ERP and CRM, uh, I'll call that Generation 1 and Generation 2. We put it all in the cloud. But really, functionally, there was no real innovation. It was just the same stuff delivered in a very different economic way and a higher quality, all, all good things, but no new function. And the second part is I, I've been in the cloud space for quite some time. So the guys at Amazon had given me $3,000 worth of computer time. Uh, for my Tsinghua class, which I started, oh God, six, seven years ago. And I walked into class and said, hey, well, here's, you know, $3,000. They'll buy you a server in Northern California, Virginia, or Ireland for three and a half years, much longer now, but then it was three and a half years. Or it'll buy you 10,000 computers for 30 minutes, which is what I really wanted to think about, which is what would you do with that? And I, I had a similar question in my head. So, so those two questions were in my head for a while. Because I started this class at Stanford called, if anybody's interested, it's called CS309A, and you can see a little brief about it at CS309A.stanford.edu. Uh, I had had Paul Moritz in my class, and Paul was um, then the uh, CEO of VMware. And um, so about 12 months later, I had a call from one of his former employees who had gone over to uh, GE, and they called up and said, would you like to have Bill Rue come and do your class. And I said, well, yeah, I'd heard you guys because I live in Silicon Valley. I heard you guys are doing something over there in San Ramon, but I have no clue. So I showed up and I expected a marketing pitch and I soon learned a lot more. And I went, you know, crap, this is big. Uh, we, as we, as technologists, as software people, we pretty much have only solved problems in, you know, the three big industries, financial services, retail, and telco, but when you go over to uh, mining, construction, transportation, healthcare, et cetera, you know, we've done very little. And uh, World Economic Forum just released a report a couple of years ago that said the Internet of Things will, you know, affect two thirds of the global GDP because most of the GDP is all this infrastructure stuff. So uh, I, about three years ago, pivoted into this area and decided, um, you know, I'd push all my chips in. Hence, as you already can surmise, I'm interested in investing in the area, small companies, interested in large companies' roles in this, and interested in educating the market. I figured that since I didn't know anything, the best way to figure it out was to write a book. So I ended up writing Precision, which we published a little bit over a year ago. 
and launched on the River Thames in London. And this year was uh, the big year to uh, push it into Asia. So we actually translated and published in uh, Vietnam. Uh, and then India, we didn't have to translate. We published you know, with McGraw-Hill. And then uh, I just got back from China where we launched uh, the book uh, published by Tsinghua University Press. So anyway, that's kind of why all that all fits together, let's say it that way. And it's interesting, you, you noted there that on the one hand, we have, we're still largely figuring out how to make these technologies relevant to traditional industry. On the other hand, we have these um, you know, research institutes and, and um, uh, intergovernmental agencies that are publishing very ambitious reports about how these technologies are going to completely transform the economy. We seem to have a bit of um, a bit of a gap between expectation, anticipation, and and where we are today. I think we want to get into your perspective on on how we can move towards that future, where where companies really are comfortable adopting technology, know how to prioritize and so forth. But maybe before we go there, if you can just give a quick perspective on where are we today um, in terms of companies actually being able to make rational analysis of what's on the market, finding solutions that are relevant, prioritizing, and, and actually bringing these into their businesses. To answer your question, I think we're very early. I mean, to me, this is a, you know at least a 25-year cycle. Uh, it probably looks a lot, you're too young to know this, but it looks like a a lot like the move to client server. I mean, it's big, it's pervasive. So, we're, but we're early. I don't know. We're year one, year two out of a 25 year cycle. And I think largely because as technology people, meaning, and I'm mostly talking about software, it's not an area that anybody's been particularly focused on. Per my comment, most of us in enterprise software were focused over in financial services and retail. We never talked to anybody in mining, you know? Part of it is a pivot of the technologists themselves and a fundamental realization that most of the technology we have built has been for what I like to call the internet of people, you know? So whether that's an e-commerce app or a CRM app, we really believe at the end of the day, it's in service of a human. And I go, and I teach my Stanford kids this, which is, Here's a tremendous piece of insight. Things are not people, <laughs> right? Things are not people. I, you know, I'll give you five reasons why they're not people. One, way more things connect to the internet than there are people. I mean, if you listen to the John Chambers speech, it's 500 billion things will be connected. Well, that's 100 times the global population rough, right? I talked to a team at Extension Health, one of the largest healthcare providers in the U.S., and he goes, yeah, already happened here in the hospital. There are way more things connected than people. Two, things can be where people are not. Things can be in your stomach. Things can be a mile underground in a coal mine. Things can be out in the middle of the Gobi Desert. You know, this is not like people. Third, things have more to say. I got to look. All we can do is type a little bit, move a mouse around. Modern day wind turbines have 500 sensors on them. They have way more to say than any human ever could. Fourth, they can say it more frequently. In the mining industry, there's a machine called a long wall shearer. It basically digs through a coal seam, and as it digs through, it forms an artificial roof. Well, one of the problems that happens is every once in a while, the roof collapses, and they have to go dig out their $100 million machine. So they want to be able to predict roof collapse. They put a vibration sensor on top that runs at 10,000 cycles per second. I mean, that's way faster than any human can type. And then the last point we can debate it is, you know, things can be programmed, people can't. <laughs> and so if you fundamentally come to a realization that things are not people, then why would technology built for the Internet of People work for the Internet of Things? And that's why I think we're in a next whole generation of software technologies because of fundamentally that reason. Interesting perspective. And you say we're in year one or, or, or two, so out of a 25-year cycle. I think what we've seen in, in China here is, yeah, in 2015, uh, 16, let's say, if we, if we take kind of the conference keynotes as an indicator, they were very much on what is Industry 4.0, what is the IoT, and then these kind of graphs that we've all seen about, you know, stage one, two, three, four. Now we see companies getting into the what have you done how did you do it? What problems did you have? So I think already we, we have a good uh, transition, at least here in terms of the mindset. And you could say, if you look at uh, who has the 
who is the bandwidth uh, traditionally to look forward? It, yeah, banking, retail, government also at times has been one of those, right? So the U.S. government pushed forward the space initiative and so forth. I think the Chinese government, as an example, is is uh, very clear minded that uh, they they want um, to push the development of industrial IoT. That they see this as a potential. So so at least here that's accelerating. I think the German government's already done a good job. Uh, in the U.S., we seem to be from my perspective, a little bit uh, less yeah. less focused, unfortunately. In terms of what you see, you know, so you're you're serving on the boards, you're you're advising um, quite a few corporates in different um, facets. What types of conversations are you having with folks around this transition? From okay, we've been developing a strategy. Now we have you know some concept that this is uh, this is critical. We have to start you know gaining experience, developing pilots, scaling pilots. What conversations are you having with folks at that level? Uh, as they try to figure out how this can can really, uh, as you say, double you know, double your revenue, quadruple your your margins. Let's divide the conversation because I think it's useful. So there's a conversation about what I like to call people who build machines. So you know, Agco builds tractors or combine harvesters or Illumina builds gene sequencers, and differentiate that from the people who use machines. So, you know, hospitals use machines, right? Farms use agricultural equipment. So, and we'll come back to that later, but let's just sit with the conversation about people who make machines. So here's my observation. I think, you know, a lot, some percentage of those guys, because we all talk a lot in the internet, right? Have heard about this IoT thing. They kind of like, oh yeah, maybe we should do something. But, and I point out that, you know, Cisco released a report earlier this year that said that 75% of these projects have failed or are stuck in POC. I think the fundamental reason for that is that, you know, today, the buyer, meaning the guy who's running an agricultural equipment uh, company, the guy who's running construction equipment company, uh, you know, transportation equipment, they typically, and I'm not saying this is everybody because Tesla is a counterexample, they typically have not, software is not an important part of their business. The important part is horsepower and torque. And so if you go into their companies and try to find anybody with software expertise, pretty much the only guy you find is a guy who's been in charge of the SAP implementation working for the CIO, right? Over on the product side, meaning the the, uh, the 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 make the machine side uh, or service the machine side, you just don't see that much, right? And so I think the traditional, I'm going to tell you really cool technology because you can consume cool technology, which is the way we've done it in the IOP world, doesn't work really well because there's nobody over there listening or asking, et cetera. And if they are, okay great, they found some cool package or cool thing and they, you know, built a connection to their machine or they did something. And then they go into rollout. And I have heard this story multiple times. And the business goes, well, why would we want to do that? That's a cool science fair project, but why do I care, right? Shouldn't we invest more in, you know, building more horsepower and more torque? (laughs) This traditionally has been done. Which, by the way, the guy who's running the product group there is well schooled. He's a mechanical engineer, well schooled in how to do that. And and he or she says, if you're going to spend a million dollars, give it to me, right? And, and so I think without a shift in understanding, you know, a new business model, the, this is just going to be us, you know, talking to the few guys in the few companies who think technology is cool. So, you know, my, my thing over the past couple of months, actually, is because I've come to this realization, having to talk and spoken to a lot of these guys, I'm like, okay, let, let's start. First of all, premise one, your machines are increasingly software defined. Uh, the example I use right now is the 2016 Porsche Panamera had 2 million lines of code in it. The 2017 has 100 million lines of software. Right. So if you appreciate that your machines are increasingly software defined, then maybe you ought to take a lesson 
from, I'll call it my business, which is the software business. And I go, what are our, our business models? What are the software business models? Because the machines are increasingly pieces of software. You know, I did a talk to uh, uh, all the 90 CTOs of the Tata group uh, about a year ago. And I got up there and I said, you know, the machine of the future is a bunch of sensors, a bunch of actuators, a big computer in the middle with a lot of software. Uh, and later in the day, the CTO of, of uh, Jaguar Land Rover got up and he said, well, you know, Tim said it's a bunch of sensors, a bunch of actuators, a big computer in the middle of a lot of software. He says, I only wish it were that way. You know, I have 18 different computer systems in my car and none of them talk to each other, right? So if you, you make this mental leap that it's all about software, then, okay, what are the software business models? And I will... I will tell you, there are fundamentally three models. Model one is sell the product and a disconnected service. So if you're a, if you're a student of Oracle Corporation, frankly, of any of the traditional software companies, you would know that uh, the business model is largely sell your product and sell you a service contract on that product, which is roughly 2% a month of the original purchase price of the product recurring every year or every month, right? Oracle, in the year before it bought Sun, so it was purely a software company, did $15 billion in revenue. $3 billion was selling you a new product, database, application, middleware, et cetera. $12 billion was service contracts on the product that had been sold all the years before. And if you go be a student of that, you will come to the realization that it is not break fix. It's that's not what is being sold. That is not what's being bought. It's not break fix. What it is is access to information about how to maintain or optimize the performance, availability, or security of the product. That makes it purely an information transfer business, which is why the margins on that on that business are north of 90%. So a north of 90% recurring revenue business, <laughs> it's something we should all want, right? Enormously high margin, recurring revenue, okay? Product plus disconnected service. Model two, shit, if I can connect to your machine, connect to your software, I could provide you more relevant, more personal information about your product. I can say, hey, you should put the security patch in to make it more secure. You should change this, the disk configuration to make it run faster, right? I can tell you all those things. And actually at Oracle, other people have done this. In, in the high-tech industry, we've done this. We've connected the machines and we will charge you incremental amount of money to provide what I refer to as assisted slash connected services, right? Okay, last, model three. What is that? Well, if I can tell you how to manage the security availability and performance, if I can optimize the security availability and performance of the product, well then, shit, I can do it for you. And so what we've all called SaaS, software as a service, is merely the fact that the guy who made the product is now servicing the product. And by the way, at that point in time, can change its business model to charge you, you know, per seat, per payment, per transaction, whatever, right? And the whole renaissance in enterprise software over the past, I'll call it 10, 15 years, all these new startups, whether that was NetSuite, Salesforce, Workday, et cetera, are all fundamentally developed in that model, right? So, and by the way, just to make a point of it, that's exactly the same thing that's happening in the computing machine business, once upon a time, we bought the computer and bought service on the computer. It has evolved into, I buy the compute as a service from guys like Amazon or AliCloud or Azure, whatever, right? That business model three, the product as a service is already happening in the hard, we'll call it the hardware product space, okay? So take that and go, okay, let's talk about machines. First of all, right? machine plus a or product your you know your semiconductor manufacturing equipment your wind turbine etc product plus disconnect a service well 
most people don't realize this, but General Electric, why are they so interested in this internet, industrial internet thing? All you have to do is be a student of their uh, financials. And people are today being much more students of their financials. Uh, but what you'll see is last year, they did $110 billion in revenue. $55 billion was selling a product, meaning a jet engine, a MRI scanner, right? And $55 billion was service on those products. And since they signed multi-year contracts for that, they end up showing you a backlog of $250 billion worth of service business. Now realize they're operating in a 50-50 model. What if they could move to an 80-20, meaning 80% was service and 20% was product? I mean, right away, I mean, you'd be looking at a 30% larger company at massively better margins. I actually spent time with a European company who operates in a 50-50 model. In 2008, he said, oh, yeah, our revenues went down, but our margins went up. And I go, yeah, I know. That's exactly true because the margins on the product business are like, you know, 3 4 5%. The, models, the margins in their service business are 30 40%. So model one, I deliver you a product plus a disconnected service. Model two, I connect to it. I get all this sensor data, right, that everybody likes to talk about. And based on the sensor data, I can provide you even better assistance on how to maintain or optimize the performance or availability of your wind turbine, your row gator, your blood analyzer, et cetera. And if you just want to model this, and I tell the guys who make machines, just do this simple model. Take, make your service price, or your service product, be 1% a month of the selling price of the product. And look at your install base. Make the assumption that you can sell every one of your install base a more advanced service. I'll tell you, it won't take you very long to realize you could double your revenues and quadruple your margins. And by the way, you're only going after customers you already have, right? Which sets you up for model three. What is model three? Well, if I can tell you what to do, I can do it for you. It is what I like to call a product as a service or a machine as a service. There are early examples of this uh, out there, but the one I like to point out to people, uh, because most people like you know know about consumer products, is uh, the automobile business, right? Okay, we've sold people automobiles and service contracts on automobiles. You know, guys like Tesla connect to your automobile and provide you some additional services. But if you want to think about what is automobile or car as a service, well, just go out and bring up your DD app or your Uber app and you're looking at it, right? That is a per ride business model for an automobile. And furthermore, if you're a student of this, you will realize that in my world of software and hardware, the number one cost for delivering a product as a service, a software as a service, or a computer as a service, is human labor to manage the software, to manage the hardware. Well, what do we do in software as a service and hardware as a service? We automate the hell out of it. We take the human out of the loop because we improve quality and we crunch costs down. Well, guess why everybody's interested in automation? If I could take the human out of the loop, right? Why would anybody ever own a car other than, I mean, I love cars, so I mean, it'd be fun, it's fun to own them, but there'd be no reason. All cars would be delivered as a service, right? Which is why it's so disruptive. I mean, people may have noticed Ford just changed out their CEO this year, right? In an industry which has been thought to be very staid, conservative, not changing, right? you're seeing a massive shift. And I tell everybody who builds machines, I mean, maybe you can hang back and wait, but at the end of the day, if your competitor does what I just said, you know, builds a product plus a disconnected, plus a connected, and then moves into machine as a service, it is not an overnight transition to get there. And you're going to be, you know, left behind. So see it either as a carrot problem double your revenues, quadruple your margins, or see it as a stick problem. You know, you're going to get put out of business because the next guy, your competitor, is going to do it in 
healthcare machines, agriculture machines, construction machines, transportation machines, et cetera. So I know that was a long answer, but that's the fundamental thing I think we have to get to is get the executives of companies that make machines to begin to grok that what digital transformation, which we love to talk about, really means is what I just said. It's a fundamental transformation of business model. I think that's actually a super clear answer. So very well structured. But I think you, at the end, pointed at one of the, the reasons that this is not occurring or not occurring as, as much as maybe uh, you think it should, which is that it's a long transition. And it, a, a lot of the companies that have been successful adopting these models have come out of the VC startup um, environment, right, where they are small, innovative teams. They're given a, a, a relatively strong let's say, runway from VC financing, as long as they produce growth, they don't necessarily have to produce you know, profit in the near term because uh, there's the expectation that by generating this data, these economies of scale, uh, securing a, a semi-monopolistic role through the, the providing of, of services, they'll eventually develop a very profitable business as, as Oracle and, and Google and, and these other businesses in the space have. And that, I think, at least my perspective, I'm, I'm interested in hearing how you, uh, how you see this. I think that's a challenge for a traditional business, which is looking at quarterly or, or annual margins and saying, okay, you know, I, I was talking with a, um, a system integrator uh, last week, and they said, yeah, we see a, a great opportunity to provide a, a maintenance as a service, predictive maintenance as a service. However, we don't see it having a strong revenue or margin improvement in the near term, we see a lot of other benefit in terms of us learning, feeding data back into R&D, into our production. Um, we, we see a lot of opportunity to learn and we feel like this could be you know, a strong business in the future, but somehow they have to make the case if they're going to invest heavily in this to basically take the dive and act almost a little bit like a VC and say, hey, we're going to finance this internal organization that's going to build up a new solution, uh, launch it to market, and expect that it's going to be a, a highly profitable, high margin you know, business, maybe in five years uh, when it matures. And that's a, that's a very different perspective to how they traditionally look at investments. Do you see that uh, this is one of the barriers, or is that just uh, maybe my experience in, uh, in a couple instances? I think the barrier is both knowledge and leadership. What I just said is not the traditional way to see your next generation blood analyzer business or your next generation tractor business, right? It's a feature function game. I like, you know, keep using the word horsepower and torque as a proxy for this. Your VP of engineering sitting at your executive staff, your product management teams, they're all organized to build more horsepower and more torque. So there's a leadership question, which is, do I believe that, you know, I'm going to take some money? And, you know, the part that they don't understand, another part they don't understand is, I actually did a talk with my GE friends on this subject, is hardware is not software. I mean, software is not a game of 5,000 people. In fact, it's a counterindicated, right? It's a game of 50 of the right people. So it's not about, you know, spending billions of dollars. It's about spending millions of the right dollars, but it will require leadership because you, I, I, I just did a talk to the American Equipment Manufacturing Association and a couple of guys came up to me afterwards and I, I said, yes, I know, which is, you know, the VP of products is fighting this because he goes, you're not giving me budget to put in more horsepower and more torque. And second of all, even if you gave me budget to build the product, by the way, your sales organization doesn't know how to sell it. I just spent, I won't name names, but very large semiconductor manufacturer, sat down with the CEO, said, how many machines do you have in the field? Tens of thousands. Wow. How much service revenue do you generate? Zero. Zero. I went, why? <laughs> he goes, well, nobody wants to pay for service. I go, well, like, <laughs> I know why. It's because you tell them, you tell them that service is break fix. And I go, well, shit, I just spent $250,000 on your machine. Why should I buy break fix service? I thought you gave me a reliable machine. You're not selling them that service as information to maintain or optimize the performance, availability, or security of your 
semiconductor. You're not even saying that to them. So why are they going to buy it? So you're, you, you've got to have a sales organization that's going to sell it. You have to have a marketing organization that's going to market it. Your business operations is not going to be the same, meaning you're used to selling them a big tractor and then paying you $250,000 for it and you walk away. This, is, this doesn't look that way. This looks like here's a contract which is renewable at, you know, 500, 5,000, 50,000 a month. So you're going to have to manage a recurring revenue business, which will, by the way, change your revenue recognition. So it's systemic to create this business. It's not only the product slash technology side, but it's also how you sell, market, and account for it. And if, you're, if you cannot lead people, if you cannot make the big decision to go down this path, then it's just going to flounder, which, you know, I think right now that's the challenge is us traditional technology people, we show up and want to find some guy who wants to listen to why my neural network's better than your neural network. Well, that's cool. Maybe we'll find that guy. But at the end of the day, that's not, that's not how this is going to be bought, my personal opinion, right? It's going to be bought because the CEO, the executive staff sits down and goes, damn it, I'm tired of seeing, which, you know, go, go be a student of Caterpillar and you will see quarter on quarter, year on year decline in revenue, in product revenue. And why? There is zero service revenue at Caterpillar. Zero. So until you get that leadership religion and then start to ask the questions, form the teams, hire the people, I've told guys in this, I've said, you know, you need a chief services officer. The chief services officer needs to sit at executive staff. That's the only way to play this game. You can't bury it somewhere, which I've seen that one. Oh, here's a team that's three layers down inside the CIA organization, and they have the, quote, IoT initiative. Okay, cool, man. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be a great POC out of it, and, you know, we'll demo something that's really interesting. But at the end of the day, unless, in my opinion, the business really starts, digital transformation really means something, and it's not just a moniker for, you know, I want a cooler website. We're not going to get from here to there. But by the way, once this starts to happen, and I keep pointing people at the automotive industry, you want to see how transition is happening. And I know automotive, I don't like to use because it has a consumer angle to it. And I'm not very interested in why, you know, toasters should talk to coffee makers. But I think automobile sits at an intersection because it's a fairly complex machine. And, you know, you're seeing it in front of us right now. And the evolution is to the point, realize this, because it's already happened in the hardware in my business. Once a guy buys the service, meaning an instance at Amazon or Azure or Google or Alibaba or whatever, the idea that that's a Lenovo server or a HP server is incidental. I don't even care. And, and if you didn't realize this, those guys do not buy. Because from the traditional hardware suppliers, because there's no reason to. They know exactly what the workload is on these machines. They can spec it out and they show up over at Foxconn and they go, guys, build me a server like this. Well, guess what? Didi can do the same thing or Uber or Lyft or whatever. They go, once you create automation, once you know the, the model of how this is being done, how it's being used, you just go to Geely and go, guys, build me a machine that looks like this. And now what does it mean to be Ford or Porsche or Mercedes, right? You're out of the loop. I mean, that's why this is so, you know, it should be so disconcerting for those guys to realize that that, that pattern could happen here as well. And now insert every other kind of agricultural construction, transportation, et cetera, machine, which, by the way, is going to even be transformed for the guys who are building anything that moves. I mean, the whole electric battery world is going to transform anything that moves. So, I mean, all of those industries, 
either. And you asked an interesting, I, I interpret it as a, a different way of looking at this, which is, is the future I'm talking about a future where a Tesla of uh, tractors is created? You know, a brand new company who's, you know, three Fudan University kids go out and build the next generation blood analyzer, the next generation uh, rogator that's software defined, uh, uses, you know, 3D printing technologies, you know, motors, batteries, et cetera. Is that what happens? Or is it, right, the traditional companies? that morph themselves over here? I don't know the answer to that question. You know, which one of these is going to happen? But I think the inevitability of it is there. We can only discuss time frames. I don't know. I don't know what the time, I mean, if I knew the time frames, I probably wouldn't be doing the podcast. <laughs> but this is an, ine- I, as inevitable, and I wrote a book called The End of Software now about 14 years ago basically outlining what would happen in the software business. I identified four young startups, Salesforce, VMware, NetSuite, and Open Harbor. And I know you've never heard of Open Harbor, (laughs) but the three others, if you'd have bought the book and bought the stock, you wouldn't be talking to me. (laughs) I, it just, I see to me, it just looks like this all over again and it's just on a much more massive scale that we're discussing this because it talks about every piece of infrastructure out there. As a, maybe as a last point, let's just end on a success case. I, I just came across uh, Mahindra Mahindra in India has uh, launched a company called Tringu, which is basically the Uber for um, agriculture equipment. It's kind of a startup within the organization. Really cool model. Um, I think it really fits India because they have this lack of infrastructure. They need a a good way for a a small farmer to rent, you know, a tractor for three hours to get a job done. Last point then, um, is there a large company, let's say a large traditional business that you've seen successfully make this transition and not just launch some POCs, but really uh, seriously um, change how their business is structured in order to evolve? I think your, your most advanced case study that anybody would actually think about is Tesla. And it, it, you know, as they evolve, my only example. Everybody else, we're still early. I go back to we're early. We're early. You see, you see little cases here and there. I mean, I'll give you, you know, Adco, I know, in sugarcane manufacturing, and there's a case in the book. They've started to evolve. You can buy the machine per bushel, right? Uh, they certainly have, you know, invested into... Uh, the whole connectivity side, et cetera. But to say that Agco's completely transformed their business, I would never argue that. You could argue that if Tesla hadn't taken this very ambitious strategy, the rest of the automotive industry wouldn't be where it is today in the midst of a transformation, right? They're they're to an extent following and they're following because Tesla is now what the largest market cap uh, automotive. So they're being assaulted from multiple directions. I think there's the Tesla direction, which is the machine itself and electricity, obviously. And then there's the DD Uber thing. DD Uber, so called machines as a service, right? And the evolution of autonomy, Google doing it. I mean, Google's doing it, DD. I mean, they're all playing autonomy. I could run machine as a service on a gasoline engine, right? But you take all, <laughs> you take all this together, and that's why life's not going to be easy for, you know, General Motors. Pick on somebody else, right? Tim, super interesting conversation. Thanks for taking the time with us today. Well, it was fun. How can people learn more about you, your book, your work? First of all, the book, Precision, available on Amazon, you know, um, available on Kindle, English, in English, and then uh, in Chinese, because I know you're in Shanghai. We just launched Tinghua University Press. I don't have the URL, but I mean, at some point in time, I'm sure you could make it available to the listeners at I, th- I know it's going to be av- available at uh, jd.com and at amazon.cn, whatever, .com.cn, either relatively soon, whatever. So I'd recommend that. Um, we're getting ready actually to launch a whole uh, class, which is based on the book, and um, it'll be in the iTunes store, Precision, again, kind of a uh, TED Talk size lectures. Um, for people who want to listen and 
watch more than they want to read. You know, obviously it's self-serving, but I think uh, precision is a good background for people because we, particularly non-technical people, to understand uh, fundamentally the technology. So we talk about the thing, meaning the machine. We talk about how it's connected and how many different ways that might be true. Uh, How do you collect data from the machine? What can you do to learn on that data? Everything from very simple learning all the way to, uh, you know, using advanced deep learning, uh, machine learning technologies, as is available from a company that I've uh, co-founded with some of my Stanford students called Lucida. And then finally, you know, once you've learned, what can you do differently? We already kind of discussed much of what that means from a business model perspective. Um, but I think it also could mean something from a software perspective. So I, I and then we we walked through that technologically, both what I call principles and then practices, meaning let me show you this in practice with a bunch of examples. And then the back half of the book is 15 different case studies, kind of tell you where you are today. So there's an example from uh, Agco's Combine Harvester uh, is a chapter. There's a chapter about Nick August who is a farmer in the Cotswolds and, uh, you know, how he does this. There's chapters on oil and gas, water, uh, construction equipment, et cetera, to give you or give the reader, I think, a good understanding of kind of where we are today and what people are doing today. So it's a little bit more rooted. I I know you already said it. We do tend uh, to do the, oh, this is going to change the world. I I started there, right, two-thirds of the level GDP. But the book, I wanted to give people a little bit of an understanding of kind of where we are. And obviously then, well, what's the gap between where we are and where we could be? Recommend people pick it up. Perfect. Yeah, we'll get that in the show notes. Tim, have a great evening. Thanks again for taking the time to talk with us today. No problem. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoT1HQ and to check out our database of case studies on IoT1.com. If you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at iot1.com. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Ventures in Industrial IoT series. You can learn how GE Ventures goes beyond funding to support their partners in technology development and commercialization at www.geventures.com.